Welcome to the Conduit Deeper podcast, a podcast that takes a deep dive into the details that surround our current sermon series. From current events to fascinating finds to conversations that take us deeper into the Word. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to our Deeper Podcast. My name is Mo, Executive Pastor at Conduit Church, joined with our lead pastor, Darren Tyler, and this week, a special guest and uh, a longtime friend, specifically of Darren and of Conduit Church, Mr. Jeremiah Johnston, all the way from Dallas, Texas, um, via Zoom. So he's not in studio with us, but he's kind of in studio with us. Modern technology makes this so much easier. He is a New Testament scholar, pastor, author, radio host, and president and founder of the Christian Thinkers Society, which is an apologetics organization, which has become so crucial to our culture and to the church at large. Darren, how did you first meet Jeremiah? Um, Jeremiah, I don't know if, I, if you're okay if I tell the story. But Please, I, th- I think it's gold. All right. <laughs> in the 90s, Jeremiah was— uh, it, just a seventeen year old kid in Kansas City got kind of I, I don't know, I guess volunteered in the church. Uh, yeah, at, I did not get paid. <laughs> yeah, and he wanted to throw a concert in Kansas City with the group Grits, uh, hip hip hop group, Grammatical Revolutions in the Spirit. Did you know that's what wow, that stood you for? Remembered that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and now here's T-bone? the th- was, no, was, was it T Bone or Ty- Tyrone? <laughs> Tyrone and coffee. It was not. It was a. Uh, well, now I can't remember. Well, coffee was one. Coffee, I but that. boned. Uh, I, by the way, Jeremiah, I represented Grits for almost a year before I realized they had stage names. So that's how white <laughs> yeah. I am. Uh, but I, uh, but yeah, Jeremiah, was seventeen years old, legally could not sign a contract, but he uh, was so convincing that I gave him. <laughs> and by the way, sold it out. A bunch of kids got saved. Yeah. And. Yeah, so that was my first introduction, and then I, it's been fun to watch you, Jeremiah, over the years go from uh, you know a street hip hop promoter to a scholar. <laughs> yeah, know. it's been a revolution, yeah. that's for sure. And, and so <laughs> that's probably a good question to start. So you've been you've been a leading voice. That's why we had you speak at Conduit, and we'll have you back. But uh, the Christian Thinker Society, you've been a leading voice in the apologetics world, but not in the old. Oh, how do I say this? Not in the cantankerous. Uh, hardcore way, but just very thought, like very thoughtful, follow the evidence. How did that happen? Like hip hop promoter to theologian (laughs) thinker? Well, uh, a couple of things. I'm I'm an apologist who hates the word apologetics. Um, Secondly, I'm the benefit of a ton of amazing mentors like you in my life, Pastor Darren. I've just Mm. had, I've been blessed since I was that age and even younger to meet pastors that are movers and shakers that have influence for God. And that's given me a, just a PhD in real life of, to see men whom God's using all over the world. And mm-hmm. that's made a huge impact on me. But what led to my, my road was, you know, my wife and I had been married for a couple of years, and we did not feel like we were Christian thinkers. We would read a passage like Matthew twenty two thirty seven, Mark 12, where Jesus says, love God with your heart, soul, and your mind. And we felt like we were ill-equipped to answer even the most pedestrian questions about our faith. And for me, it wasn't like I had a crisis of doubt. I just wanted to know more. I became a truth addict. And for me, that meant a calling to go to what is the intellectual Jerusalem. We moved to Oxford during the swine flu epidemic in 2009. And I started doing school again. I I went to literally PhD school, had two masters, and enjoyed studying there and did a terminal degree on the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ that was actually later published as a monograph in the Jewish and Christian text academic monograph series. This is number 21. This this was three years of my life to get me a PhD, the resurrection of Jesus and the Gospel of Peter, a tradition historical study of the Achmim Gospel Fragment. So my specialty is extra-canonical Gospels in the second century. Um, But while I was at Oxford, I had this vision to do events that would bring all of God's people together who had questions because I felt like there were questions in the church that never got addressed from the pulpit. And I thought it was going to be a few people in the room in a church on Wednesday night, and it just grew from there. And I often tell people, you know, our brand, Christian Thinker Society, really came out of the fact that I wasn't a Christian thinker. And I think that Audrey and I became our ministry before we ever realized we had one. And only then did we realize how exciting it is to be a Christian thinker. And we just, we wanted to have a conversant faith. So it it launched from there in 2009 and and God's just done something really special with it since. Yeah, it's been cool. So, you know, I became actually officially a pastor by 2010. And similarly, 
I think that when, when the people talk about being God calling you to do something, uh, I've wondered if it's more like it's not that he's calling you to do something. It's just he's calling you what who you are. Like I'm just calling yes. you. Like I call this a table. It doesn't make it a table. I'm just calling it because it's a table. Mm-hmm. So he's call you were already a Christian thinker, right? You became that now. And so he's just yeah. calling you that. And that just became the ministry that you were right born into. And, the, and to that end, part of the, the main reason for today that uh, I, I, honestly, I feel bad we haven't had him on sooner. Like I, I do feel like I'm, there's a part of me that's like, what were we thinking? We weren't thinking. We weren't, we weren't Christian thinking. But, um, <laughs> but the, the Shroud of Turin, which was a part of your book already, like, the, you know, the, you're not a bandwagon t- you know, Shroud guy. Like you've been on this for years. Mm-hmm. But in just the last, it seems like a couple of weeks, maybe a month, you know, everybody yep. from Glenn Beck to Seth Gruber, I mean, everybody's talking about the Shroud of Turin. And of course, I'm like, Jeremiah was already on this. Like he was, he was, he was Shroud before Shroud was cool. <laughs> but so that's part I wanted to, there's an update yeah. on the Shroud of Turin. And, Very and, current. But let me ask you, let's start with this. Let's assume that there are going to be some people that are listening that have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. What is the Shroud of Turin? Yeah, absolutely. So Jesus is buried according to Jewish burial customs of the first century. He's not mummified. He's not embalmed. He is buried according to how a first century Jew would be buried in in Judaica. Okay, so that means that um, he's condemned to die by the Sanhedrin. And so according to the Jewish Mishnah, two members of the Sanhedrin ask Jesus— Um, excuse me, according to Mishnah, if the Sanhedrin condemned someone to die, it was upon the Sanhedrin to bury the condemned criminal. And so what do we see reflected in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Two members of the Sanhedrin request Pilate, the body of Jesus from Pilate. That would be Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And it says that they prepared Jesus' body for burial. And what we know is that Jesus is buried in a new tomb. He's buried in the tomb of a rich man. Um, We're very confident where that tomb is today, by the way. Um, And he is laid in a burial shroud, Athonia in Greek. And this is very important because um, when people look at the Shroud of Turin and then they read their English translations, they feel like there's some inconsistencies because the Shroud of Turin is a linen burial garment that has an image reflected in the actual linen cloth. It is a molecular mm-hmm. image that has both a, uh, a chemistry to it and it even has a physics to it. We'll get to that. Yeah. So. We're talking about a burial shroud that has blood all over it, and Jesus, so that's what it is. It's just simply a burial garment. And that's not a big deal because we actually have burial garments. We have hundreds of them from uh, Jerusalem. We have hundreds of them, thousands of them from antiquity. Um, We actually have a linen uh, shirt, the Tarkan dress. You can look at this on some of my other YouTube videos that goes back to 3000 BC. So it's 3000 years older than the shroud. So um, linen, clothes, burial garments being around for thousands of years is not uh, interesting in scholarship. That what, is, what makes this one in particular interesting is that when you look at it, it has an image in it of a crucified man. And mm-hmm. that's where it gets very interesting. And at some point, the Catholic Church and, and I, correct me when I'm off or yeah. wrong, you know, there's a, 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 a church in Turin, Italy, which is where the name Correct. Trout of St. Turin. John. Yeah, St. Yep. John. Okay. So let me ask you this then. So I've been to Italy. I've been to Venice. Like there's a, there's a chapel in Venice where they say they've got the thumb of St. Thomas the Apostle. Yeah. You know, and when you ask them, they're like, well, maybe. We're pretty sure. And, yeah. I've, you know, you, you've been to Israel way more than I have. And there are those sites in Israel that uh, we, it's a guess. We don't know. There's a, there's spots where this could be it, probably it. And then there's, we know this is the spot. Yeah. How do you know what made you go from this is maybe the thumb of St. Thomas, right? Whatever. How did you go from skeptic to believer? I mean, if this is yeah. true and accurate, this is a big deal. Yeah. And I think that's why it's in all the headlines. I think it's why it's very timely. You're bringing it to your audience because I do happen to think it's a very big deal. And I want to make sure people understand when I'm talking right now, I'm not getting into a religious trance. I'm not hoping that it's true. We have enough evidence with or without the the Shroud of Turin to give an airtight case for the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. I've published over 250,000 words in both academic and popular books on, on the physical bodily resurrection. I've published more on the resurrection in the last 10 years than anyone I know of. So 
I understand how airtight, how strong the case is for the resurrection. But what's amazing is as Christians, we're living in the golden age of Christian apologetics as we started the show, and we keep having more and more evidence to fuel our faith. I believe in an evidence-based Christianity. I believe in evidence-based belief. We do not have faith in faith. We don't just come up with faith or work it up in our heart. Our faith is always defined by its object. I want to be very clear with that because there seems to be this misnomer, I don't need evidence, I just believe I'm a better Christian than you. Well, that's not the kind of faith we see reflected in the New Testament. I want to blow that up for some Pharisees who are watching. Like, I don't need all this evidence. I read my Bible and I just must have a more current faith or a more sincere faith than you do. Well, when we actually look in the Gospels, nobody expected Jesus. Jesus to rise from the dead. Nobody would have interpreted Isaiah 53 the way we do today. And it took the resurrection. It took seeing Jesus nail-pierced wrists and hands. By the way, that's the same word in Greek, hand and wrists. Um, it took seeing the wound on his side for Thomas to believe. And so we have an evidence-infused faith. And so I, I have an allergic reaction, Pastor Darren, to relics. Like I, Audrey and I have yeah, done Reformation tours of Germany yeah. where they have the three wise men in Cologne and and I've done a huge personal study back in 2008 on Martin Luther and how Frederick the Wise was his great benefactor. And Frederick was a hardened Catholic, but I mean, he's the reason Martin Luther stayed alive and we had a Reformation. He's the reason Frederick the Wise is really the reason we have the Bible we have today, because he kept Martin Luther from getting killed. But it was by the end of his life, he put all his relics away and started just reading the Bible. So I have a reaction to relics. But what's interesting about the Shroud, I think I, I did not— take it into account, because I just thought that's like a Catholic relic, like what you're saying mm -hmm. that they have in Venice, the thumb of the disciple or the three wise men. But it actually did not come under the control of the Catholic Church until after I was born, uh, seven years after I was born, in 1988. So that's the, an interesting the, point. I don't want to skip yeah, over that, really Jeremiah. Is. I yeah. did not know that. I thought that it had yeah, been it was in control. Yeah, in private hands. Yeah, it was in private hands until 1988. In fact, the Catholic Church doesn't even have custodial ever. It actually was given to the Pope himself. Interesting. Whoever the current Pope is has power to bring the shroud out. So you can go today to Turin, Italy, and you will not see the Shroud of Turin. It hasn't been on display since 2015. You will see a venerated facsimile, yeah. <laughs> okay? Like you could see at any other museum, perhaps, of the Shroud. Um, they are bringing it out in 2025 again, and you will see crowds, hundreds, thousands strong each day line up to see the shroud. And so um, that's what got me along. I, then I start, so that first I had to get over my reaction. Okay, so this isn't a Catholic relic. This is different than some of the other things. So what is the evidence based on it? And this is where I want to be a careful Christian thinker. I don't want to read what somebody writes in their book. I want to read the primary literature. I want to read the research. And so there's really five reasons that I think the Shroud of Turin is overwhelmingly um, not only not a hoax, I think it's legitimate. I actually think it's the burial garment of Jesus himself. Yeah. Well, and, and to that end, I mean, we obviously you've got a whole lot of them, but those are like the, the five ones. I mean, do you want to just go through them? Absolutely. I'd love to. I think that'd be fun for the audience. And if yeah. you guys just, you guys help me be clear for your audience. And, uh, that's and whatever I job, over, <laughs> that's Mo's job, by the way, to make it clear. My job is to I make it confusing. You know, let me know. So we've covered what a shroud is. We've covered it's in the Piedmont district, Northern Italy. We've, we've explained that there's an image in the shroud. Now it didn't become famous until 1898 when um, uh, Secondo Pia took a picture of the shroud in the late 1800s, and literally his negative became a positive, and that's the image that we're all used to seeing. It's the black and white image, if you will. It's not the sepia image that you see with your naked eye if you walk up to the shroud. It's the actual negative that became a positive, really. Of And we need to go back to our photo developing days, for those of you who remember that before digital photography. Everyone was stunned. So they immediately thought it was a hoax then. They thought the, photo the photographer had created a hoax. And that's what started the shroud frenzy. It really didn't begin until 1898 with this photo. Now, we know that, that we have evidence that actually goes back to the 6th century about the shroud in Edessa, Constantinople, and then eventually with different families in France. Um, and so it's fascinating to me when you just look at it from these different angles, how, how this starts to grow in importance, I think, for the follower of Jesus. So number one, it's the most studied archaeological artifact in the world. And I, I cannot emphasize this enough. 
1978, a group of weapons scholars from Sandia Labs and the Air Force Academy, so not a group of theologians, had access to the Shroud for five days, guys. And they, it, it was a big hurry-up deal because their equipment got caught up even in customs. They only had five days, no matter what, with the Shroud to do their testing, their the photographs. And it took two years for the results to come out. And in 1981, the, you can go read this for yourself, the STIRP, Shroud of Research, Shroud of Trend Research Team, published a report where they said as, and these are the world's greatest scientists. These are, I mean, I mean these are rocket scientists. And they're saying, we cannot explain how the image is in the shroud. So that's a second reason. So the, I want to make sure people don't lose yeah. this. There is not a close second. It is the most cross-disciplinary studied artifact in the world. Science today cannot explain how there is an image of this crucified man in the shroud. It me, it, one British man has offered one, mil, one million pounds payment to anyone who can who can uh, uh, redo a shroud type hoax who could do it in their own lab or whatever. No one can do it. Number three, I began reading, and this is where guys like Josh McDowell really came out against the Shroud of Turin is when the radiocarbon dating came out. A lot of evangelical scholars began to discount it um, because in 1988, 10 yeah. years after the 78 team, three different labs released their um, radiocarbon dating. And radiocarbon dating is a, is a very accurate way of dating things. Um, and it all came back about 700 years. So it came back to the 13th, 14th century. So they came out and said the shroud is a hoax. It, its provenance is the Middle Ages, and it's certainly not Jesus's. And a lot of evangelical scholars ran with that. What, but, you know, we need a, a lot of times in scholarship, we have to give time for the scholarship to work itself out. The British Library, or, or excuse me, the British Museum was one of the labs and that had all the raw data, and they suppressed that raw data for 25 years. It was only recently when a French attorney and a shroud defender through a Freedom of Information Act got the British Museum to release the raw data, we realized that the radiocarbon dating on the shroud was actually taken from patchwork done to the shroud in the Middle Ages. You have to understand, in that, in that era, if you gave a big enough gift to whatever church that the shroud happened to be at in France at the time, you could get a, you could get a, you could get a piece of the shroud sent to you, to your house. You know, I mean, it was like an indulgence. Like for, a televangelist in the 80s. Yeah, literally. It was like a holy thing. And so they, they would patch the shroud. And then we realized, and I actually have slides to this end, um, they would realize that, hey, they actually use patches from the Middle Ages. We know that the shroud has survived a few fires. Uh, we know that it's had incense burned on it. And so all of that was accurate. Yeah, the, this there's actually, you know, what is smoke? It's carbon, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it survived a fire in the Middle Ages. So we would expect that. So um, the, it's now been shown, and I have all of the reports right here in front of me. I have the actual primary data the radiocarbon dating from 1988 on the Shroud of Turin is completely erroneous. No one should cite it. No one should use that as a reason not to right. believe in the Shroud. And that's really the only reason people do. So those are three of my five, if you guys want to in interact with those. Well, I guess just knowing that it's been 36 years since 1988, over the course of 36 years, they've been debating this back and forth, using this 1988 date as the most recent "Quote unquote proof," which doesn't add up. What has prompted the most recent study here in 2024 mm -hmm. to yeah. all of a sudden bring this back up? Is just new technology emerging to yeah. to help yeah. prove the point? Yeah, this is amazing. I mean, this is again where it's really cool. So, Waxis wide angle um, uh, spectrum uh, X ray, Waxis, the Institute of Crystallography in Italy. Um, did this wide angle image analysis of the fibers of the shroud. And they show, and again, I have the reports, you can, you can look these up for yourself. It shows that the fibers in the shroud have been decaying for 2,000 years. Okay? I want to make sure people heard that right. The fibers in the shroud have been decaying for 2,000 years. They have not been decaying for 700 years. Um, then the second report that came out has to do with the blood. And I've actually been updating a lot of my research on the wounds inflicted in the crucified man. Um, I, I did a lot of research at Notre Dame in Jerusalem alone. I had access, full access to the shroud exhibit there uh, right before the October 7 attack, by the way. So this is pretty current. And I did a big study just on the wounds of the crucified man. And back then, I thought there were 372 wounds on the crucified man. But what I didn't take into account were the sides that the shroud does not cover 
So it's not like he would have no wounds on his sides going down, you know, his right side and his left. And so now I've updated it that Jesus was probably endured flagellation to the tune of 120 um, lashes by those Roman executioners. Of course, in Jewish law, it was not permitted to lash a, even a criminal more than 40 lashes. Jesus likely endured 120 lashes. So it throws Romans 5.8 into a whole new light for me, how God demonstrates his love for me. Um, and so, yeah, I'm fascinated. So that's the second report. The second report shows they've studied the blood. It's type AB blood. It's the rarest blood blood type in the world. We know it's human blood. It's not animal blood. So again, you, you start going through all the hoaxes. How are you going to get human blood? And there are pints and pints of blood on the shroud, okay? It's type AB blood. It's Semitic. It's from the land of Jerusalem. How are you going to know this in the Middle Ages? Like you, you have to start, it, it takes more faith to believe that this is a hoax than that it's actually legitimate. Um, and so it's type AB blood, but the latest report that just came out a month ago or so ago is that the man, the crucified man in the shroud died from his circulation started to slow because he was enduring such incredible trauma. So that he was, his oxygen was show, slow, was uh, his blood pressure going up, his circulation going down, and he was dying of asphyxiation. Again, everything that's consistent with the gospel narratives of how right. Jesus died by how, Roman crucifixion. How can they tell that just by looking at the blood itself? Yeah, there's, there's cre creatinine, not to be confused with creatine in the blood. They actually take bloods. They have blood samples. Yeah. Um, there's high levels of ferritin. I know this because my dad almost died and had organ failure during his battle. With, thank God God healed him. But I, I remember That wasn't his, that long ago, man. That, no. I, and we his, were I remember they were, thank you so much. God healed my dad completely. Praise the Lord. But I remember them bringing in his ferritin reports when I was with them, and it was sky high. So when I read, oh, the crucified man had very high ferritin. Well, that means that he was having organ failure. I knew that. I'm not even a medical doctor. I just know that from being uh, in right. my dad's hospital room. And then there were high levels of bilirubin. Now, this is fascinating because skeptics of the shrouds say, well, if, if you take human blood and you put it on a burial garment like we have from other burial garments, it's kind of a brown, dark brown, blackish color. But, you know, the shroud is red, people. Like, that's fake blood. Well, no. The liver secretes bilirubin if you're under trauma, which causes the blood to stay red on contact with oxygen. And so, again, this is how would you know that? medically in the Middle Ages. Like, you just wouldn't even know that to, enough to even fake it. And so to answer your question, Pastor Darren, bilirubin, creatinine, and yeah. ferritin are in the blood, and that's how they know. And this is this report's just a month old. That, again, it's human blood. The crucified man of the shroud died by trauma. Uh, his circulation slowed, and he probably died by asphyxiation eventually. Hmm. Can you maybe talk about how the, the shroud is actually— applied to the body. And I think I think a lot of people think that it's he's wrapped like a mummy in some sort like that's yeah. the imagery that we have but it's it's yep. it may be hard to describe over audio and I'll, obviously on video it's easier. Yeah. I let's pretend my iPhone is a is a dead body. Okay? The body is placed and the, this is the burial shroud right here. Okay? The shroud that we know of is 14 a little over 14 feet long and it's about 4 feet wide, okay? This is a this great question Pastor Mo. The body is placed like this. You see that? And like almost like a sandwich or how some people eat their pizza, it's then put over this way. So the head right there, both the front and the back of the head, and then the feet come out at the end. Do you guys? Yeah. And so for those that like are listening pita. and not watching this, yeah, exactly. It's like a pita. That's how the body was wrapped. And, and then they would have had strips that went around horizontally. This is what some, again, people, if you read the Bible in a wooden way and you know nothing of the... Of interpretation, you're going to say, well, there, you know, the shroud isn't consistent because, you know, in John chapter 20, which we can get to if you want, there's also a second burial garment. We can get to all that. So, but the, that is what how his body would have been placed. And again, so it wouldn't have been airtight, like wrapped like a mummy. It would not mm -hmm. have been embalmed. It would the body would have been spiced because why the body stinks, um, according to Jewish burial tradition. Yeah. That's why the women are going to the tomb on April. 5th, AD 33, they're going to spice the body more so they can mourn the Jesus for seven days, as was their custom. They would have tried to collect his bones a year later, a process known as oscillagium, collecting of the bones, and then placed him in a bone box in ossuary. So that's how, that's how it is. So when you unwrap the shroud, then you have the front and the back of the crucified man head to head, if that makes sense. Makes a ton of sense. Yeah, I think that's just helpful. Because I... I I just believe that a lot of people think when they when they see or think of the Shroud of Turin that it's this wrapped body. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Because you had mentioned just a, just previously that the sides maybe didn't show up as as much because right. it was wrapped in that way. Huh. Makes that, but that what, here's the fascinating the thing. So you bring up an interesting point there, and this is number four. This is what blew the mind of, of these weapons and Air Force Academy. Again, not Bible scholars, okay? These Bible scholars don't know this stuff. Again, PhDs know a lot about a little in a very specific area. So you know, true. my expertise is the first century, you know, resurrection, execution. I can tell you all about the first century world, and that's it. So, um, but these weapons specialists had what was called a VP-8 image analyzer, okay? This goes back to the 1970s. And when they put a when they would put a normal photograph through a VP8 image analyzer, it just it just uh, essentially measures light on a photo, and a 2D image comes out. When they put the image of the shroud through, this would have not been the pictures from Barry Schwartz in 1978. This would have been an earlier image that C.S. Lewis had in his room. Um, the image has a topographical quality. It's a three dimensional image, and no one can explain this. When you put the image through, it, it looks 3D, and no one can explain. And that is literally what launched the 1978 uh, research team to go to Turin, Italy, is that the VP8 image analyzer revealed the image in the shroud has a three-dimensional quality to it. There's It's what I said earlier. There's both um, physics to it, and there's a chemistry to it. And no, So then the research team goes and does all their testing, and they say there's no pigment, there's no dye, there's no... Um, artificial color or paint added to the shroud, we do not know how there is a molecular image in the shroud. And then when they looked under the microscope, um, not to get too technical, but I think it's important, you know, a, 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 a thread will have, be, a little thread is made of several fibers that are woven together. The image of the shroud is superficial on those fibers, meaning it doesn't penetrate all the way through like if you just slapped paint on something, it's superficial. So it, we can't explain it, even to this right. day. And well, they part of what, in the 70s. Part of what you can't explain or cannot be explained, again, correct me if I'm wrong, I know just enough about this to be wrong, that the amount of energy that it would take oh. to put that in place had to be so fast because it would have, the heat would have burned the linen. Right. Right? So it can't be... We have no way to, to do it where we you know, would burn the linen up, but something happened so quickly, so powerful, photosynthesis, I don't know what it is that, You're exactly right. that created it, something. It, and this is where I get the chill bumps, because it would have happened, in my notes, one fortieth of a billionth of a second, something like a laser beam moving at 2.5 billion watts. That's the estimation, Okay. Um, so you talk, and, and the flash emanates from the whole body. It doesn't emanate from the head or the feet or the heart. It's, it's like the whole body. So the question is, is this an image of the moment of Jesus' physical resurrection? That's the question that we have to deal I, with. And I what mean, are the implications of that? I mean, doesn't it feel like that? Like a, a Well, kind of... I mean, Darren, you shared this, uh, what was it, maybe two Christmases ago. You talked about the spark of life at conception, the spark of light yeah. at conception. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, that's um, good. And you, you dove into all the, the kind of the science behind that, yeah. which was interesting for a Christmas Eve service. But it was awesome <laughs> because it, it, it just— Well, I did do that on Christmas Eve, didn't I? <laughs> I love it. But it, but it was—it just showed the power of, of life from light. And so it doesn't feel like it could be far removed to believe yeah. a similar thing happened. I mean, does right. it seem like, Jeremiah, like this is the description of something physical becoming spiritual— yeah, I think so. Or, or a merging of both. I mean, that's, that's oh, how I read yeah. the new heaven and the new earth. Heaven and earth come together, the physical, the supernatural. I, I think it's the new heaven, the new earth, the new physical body, which we all know, according to 1 Corinthians 15, is not like our current bodies. Right. It can do things that our current bodies can't. And, you know, it, I just, I am amazed when I look at the evidence. And so my, my area of specialty then comes in with number five. So I, I, my, my job when I was in Oxford was to date previously undated documents. We do codicology, paleography. Paleography is a study of handwriting styles. Codicology studies the history of codices, codex, uh, singular. But all the data, excluding the C14 on the shroud, so this would be there's floral. I mean, we haven't even gotten into that. There's pollen that only comes from the uh, the world of Jesus. Um, right. Flax uh, origin is from the Middle yep. East as well. Is yep. that correct? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what was that? The, the flax origin of, of yes. the actual yes. shroud itself. Exactly. And it's a herringbone weave. Yeah, I mean, we can get into yeah. the weeds on this. So like the, the herringbone weave would have 
this would have been a very expensive garment because a her- to do a herringbone weave of a linen garment, um, only someone rich could have paid for this. Again, we see that's consistent with the burial traditions. The, the archaeological, hematological, that's the blood, fabric, the historical data, it all points to a much earlier origin, and I believe it exhibits verisimilitude with the world of Jesus. So that it's very similar. That's a very important word, verisimilitude. It exhibits someone it's what we would expect of the first century. <laughs> Micah, can you Google verisimilitude? What do you say? Verisimilitude. Verisimilitude. <laughs> verisimilitude. <laughs> <Verisimilitude. laughs> Glutide. I, I do have one question about the blood samples. Um, I don't know how. Are you familiar with Ron Wyatt by chance? No. Ron Wyatt. Um, he's he's a local Tennessee guy, um, but has done a bunch of research around Christ's blood specifically. He may or may not be a nut. Yeah, well, okay. he he contends that there was twenty four chromosomes in Jesus's blood, and that twenty three were X in one Y chromosome. And there's he's got a whole uh, almost a museum at his home with all of these different artifacts and a ton of studies into Christ's blood specifically. I was just curious if any of these blood uh, tests more recently would line up with with this find. Yeah, you're the second person who's asked me about the chromosome of the blood work, and I haven't read anything about the chromosomes from, and Alan Adler, I'll just mention this for your audience, if they want to do their own research, did the, he was the heavyweight that did all the, the blood samples on the shroud, and those have been published, they're freely available, you can read those, but I've, I've actually, I'm not familiar with anything uh, related to chromosomal studies of the blood of the shroud. Yeah, it's just an interesting angle, yeah. right? I mean, if they're studying the blood to get all Absolutely. the way down to the chromosomes, so it's just an interesting uh, little so, potential fact there. Another thing skeptics will say, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it, it seems like the evidence is pointing that this is a first century burial shroud. Big deal. We have hundreds of those. How do you know that this man who's crucified is Jesus of Nazareth? Well, again, this is where I do put on my, I know a lot about a little hat. Um, of the hundreds of crucified victims, we know of only one that had a helmet of thorns placed on his head. We know of no other crucified victim that was crucified that way. Pilate is shocked that Jesus was so soon dead because normally the crucified victims would hang on the cross for a day or two or maybe even three. It was part of the um, embarrassment. Of course, they were hanging there completely naked. Um, Jesus, um, there's a lance wound in the side of the of, yeah. on the Shroud of Turin that's about three inches um, wide, um, a little under three, uh, where the lance would have entered and penetrated the heart. Um, so again, you know, you start looking at this. No one else was crucified that way. His, the legs are not broken. Um, and when the man, and I have to be careful again on these media shows when I say this, he likely had a broken nose. Um, but again, I don't mean his bone is broken because some people will throw the passage at me. Well, not a broken bone on his body is broken. Mm-hmm. What I mean is the cartilage. Like his nose is clearly like the cartilage is like pressed to the side. Right. What I'm saying is Jesus experienced trauma in such a way that he died very quickly. We know he died in less than six hours on the cross, and normally it took a few days. And that's the point I'm making. So when you, is that consistent with what we see of the crucified man of the shroud? Yeah, we have a crew, we have, and I want to blow this myth. It's not like he had a sweatband on, kind of a little cute, kind of prickly. No, it was a helmet, a cap of thorns placed on his head, penetrating his head all over from the front to the back inside. And again, that's what we see consistent with the shroud, the face is extremely marred um, by blood from this cap of thorns penetrating his head, his scalp, all over front and back. So um, he would have been asked to carry the patibulum, and so the man of the shroud on the right side, especially, has additional wounds, likely from carrying the patibulum. That that's the la- that's the cross, the cross beam beam. of the cross. So after enduring 120 lashes, and remember those lashes had at least three cords. Okay, so 120 times three. You've got, and then it had these barbell-looking um, lead balls at the end that would just rip into your skin, literally, and pull your guts out, essentially. Jesus is then asked to carry this 60 to 70-pound patibulum, and that's being generous. It might have been heavier. He can't do it. Right. And we notice that the crucified man has additional just scorches on his, or excuse me, just rubbing uh, abrasions on his shoulder trying to carry the right. cross. So it's fascinating. The thing that is um, encouraging to me, and and if you've not read Jeremiah's book, Body of Proof, stop everything and order it right now. Because I, um, for me, uh, 
uh, Paul's words were true, right? If if Jesus was not resurrected, right, I am to be pitied. Yeah. Above None all, of this matters. Everything hinges on that, and you know, now I I was a lot more lazy than you. I didn't go to Oxford to figure it out, but that was a big deal for me over the years. Like if he, if if if, if it's like the the, uh, the Jenga. Jesus mm-hmm. Jenga. If that one is pulled yeah, out, the analogy. whole thing falls apart. Exactly. And so, when you your book body of proof, it covers way more than the shroud, obviously, because there is evidence. And to this, I I've been to Israel. I've seen the tomb. I've also, you know, I bet I know that right now you could go to the tomb of Muhammad. You can go to the tomb of Buddha mm-hmm. because, and, and for anything we know about the Catholics, if there was a tomb with Jesus in it, there'd be a church on it. Like that, yep. we we know that veneration is a thing. But they haven't because there isn't, because the tombs are empty. Um, there's not a, a body in it. My question is this. If, like, I appreciate it. I remember, I'm, I'm old enough and nerdy enough to remember the, the like, dis- it would have been Discovery. It would have been, like, Dateline or, I don't know, whatever shows yeah. were going on in the 80s, you know, talking about how this is a hoax. And it was, you know, mm-hmm. for, all I, for all I remember, it was, like, Geraldo. I don't remember. But. It didn't hurt my faith because I hadn't put my faith into a shroud being proof. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, knowing that this exists not to be worshipped, um, but for wisdom for us, it, it is encouraging to know that you know God could have preserved this as, as for our Thomas moment, right? For us to say, okay. This this alone does not prove the resurrection of Jesus, but it, you put it against all the other body of proof, and it becomes impossible right. to believe. What what is it in your mind, your heart, that is important right now for a believer to to think about when they think about the shroud of Turin? Like you specifically said, we don't worship it. Very important, right? Right? It, right. It's, it's yeah, not it's, something we worship. Yeah, and it's not a graven image either. A lot of Christians say, "Well, this is a graven image." This yeah, is a say more. Of the say more about that. Yeah, yeah, say more that, about that. That's a great important. question that actually Micah here asked me as well, who's a great Christian thinker. You know, is this a graven image? Because is this a violation of the second commandment? Looking at this thing in awe. Well, I don't think it is because it's not man-made. I think the shroud is a miracle, and mm-hmm. I'm okay saying that as a as a critical scholar. Uh, it, there is no human explanation that science can give for how the image of the shroud is there. Therefore, um, it's not man-made. So it's not a graven image. And for me, it is an object that, um, again, adds more evidence to my faith. And what's cool about Christianity, unlike any of the world religions, is that archaeology is Christianity's closest cousin. And the reason this matters, the reason to answer your question, the shroud matters, is we're living in perilous times where I remember when you were at your church, you quoted that quote, "We we need strong men for tough times, and we don't have that. And One of the challenges that we have is we don't have a biblical worldview. And the center of a biblical worldview is the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the center of a Christian worldview. It's not um, inerrancy. It's not, and that's important. It's not um, how I interpret certain passages that are important. It is the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. Paul says this is a matter of first protois. Uh, It's of first importance. Um, out of 32,000 words Paul gives us in the Greek New Testament, he says, what I'm about to write to you is the most important, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. That is what is important to a Christian worldview. There's 300 passages in the New Testament on the resurrection, there, and there's only 260 chapters in the whole New Testament. So when you think about 300 passages on the resurrection, we see that a resurrection-centric faith is essential. There's 89 chapters in the Gospels, only four, excuse me, only four deal with Christmas. Um, But more than one half of the Gospels deal with the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus in those last eight days in the Passion. So we see clearly that it was the focal point of the church. The the teaching that Jesus rose from the grave actually took precedence over Jesus' own dominical teaching in the church, which is fascinating to think about, meaning the event of Jesus' resurrection became even more important than the teaching of Jesus himself Uh, And that's what caused the church in Acts 17 to take the world by storm and turn the world upside down. And so that's why it's important. Have you seen uh, AI kind of enter the chat with the Shroud of Turin? Oh, yeah. Mid-journey AI, yeah. (laughs) Um, You know, they've they've uploaded images of the Shroud to get a a picture of what Jesus would look like now um, or would look like back then using technology now from AI. 
And it's it's quite fascinating, actually. You know, since um, since this report came out about a, a month ago, these images are flying around the internet. And I got to be honest, the the images that are that it's kicking out. Um, look a lot like Jonathan Rumi. <laughs> really? I was thinking Jared Leto. <laughs> Jared Leto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the Jonathan Someone Rumi's said on the, my wall, Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> yeah, little Matthew McConaughey. Jonathan Rumi, who's the guy that plays Jesus yeah. in The Chosen, which, uh, you know, it's like, wow. Okay. That's fair. Now that you say that, I can I see mean, that. You can see that. Little Jared Leto, Jonathan Rumi. Definitely not Jim Caviezel, though. Like, I, I feel bad because yeah. Caviezel's a good looking guy, but he didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's interesting, and I'm wondering if you know, how AI will maybe play into some of this. You know, emerging technologies are always going to continue to be at the forefront of, you know, scientific studies. So I'm curious to know if AI is going to be introduced into, you know, further, what we would believe, further proof of mm -hmm. this. Without a doubt. I think so. And I mean, this latest image that came out through the Daily Express using mid-journey AI is a striking image. I think it's powerful. I love it. It's actually. chilling, I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, it is. It is. That's a good word. It's chilling to look at. It's interesting. It's fascinating. And, you know, machine learning is just what, it's as good as the data that's inputted. Yeah. But um, I think it'll just help us appreciate the shroud better at, at different levels. Um, you know, having gone to Notre Dame where they actually have a life-size version of the crucified man, and that's another thing the medieval church would not have gotten correctly. You know, if we were creating a hoax in, in the Middle Ages, we would create an effeminate Jesus. He wouldn't have a full beard. He would be like five foot seven or eight. Well, the yeah. crucified man's almost six feet tall, full beard. Um, and one thing I do want to come back on is John 20, because I want to hopefully for the benefit of your audience, you know, some people say, well, this the shroud doesn't line up with the, the gospel narratives because the gospel narratives say that in John 20, when Peter and John run to the tomb. They see the linen shroud there, and then they see his, the, the head napkin, essentially, like the face covering over in the corner. Well, we know what that is. That is the sidorium. That is the uh, that is the, what essentially a jaw cap. Um, just like the funny pictures, you know, I just did a tour of, in the land of the Apostle Paul, and all these college kids take pictures of each other sleeping with their mouth wide open, and then they share them on the group chat. So uh, to... to, to dignify the body. Nobody wanted the body in rigor mortis with the mouth wide open. And so they would simply tie, literally, like a jaw cap or underneath the face coming up around the top of the head to keep the mouth right. closed. And that's probably what Jesus Interesting. flew off. And so. am I remembering, too, then there were two coins that were on his yeah. in the, in yeah. the shroud? That yeah, this is that numismatic studies um, that are over his eyes. Again, consistent with what we know of certain burial practices throughout the Roman Empire. Yeah, th what I remember reading about that, it it wasn't as convincing because it wasn't as clear, but the the there was somewhat of a consensus that they looked like pilot coins. Yeah, that it, it, there was only yeah. manuf that would have been at the time a pilot. Yep, and two doctors have said they can even see teeth in the image behind the lips. Like, how could you fake that? Again, it's like yeah. an X-ray image. Um, yeah, but what we know is it's it's it was a bolt of electromagnetic energy that put the image on the on the cloth. And that's what we do know. We just don't know how it happened. And that's nobody cool important right now has been able to replicate this or know no. how to replicate because they'd obviously they'd have a million pounds in their pocket if they figured it out. Exactly. They would. And they would have a lot of notoriety, book deals to, to be able to prove that it was a hoax. No one can do that. Yeah. So what do we do with this? Do you know who's funding this most recent study that used the, uh, the Waxis Technology. I, I would assume um, the Institute of Crystallography themselves did the has has the because the, and then they published it in the Heritage Journal, which is a very respective respected scientific journey journal. So, I would I would assume they did the research on their own um, and through their own labs. That's that's what I get from reading it. So I'm not sure who funded it or if any funding was even necessary um, outside of just what they do in their labs. A few years ago, I was in. Uh, North Africa and with a guy named Cleo who uh, leads hundreds of house churches, underground churches in North Africa. And he told me that the way that he leads someone out of Islam is deeper into Islam. Mm -hmm. and, and what he meant was that the deeper you go into Islam, the more it falls apart. Wow. That's and, a good word. And uh, it was, yeah, because he, he said that that's how he came to faith in Christ was he came down to the conclusion that the deeper he got into Islam, either he needed to become a terrorist or that yep, Islam exactly. was wrong, you know, so the deeper end. But the thing that I loved wow. about what you've done and continue to do is that the deeper you go into Christianity, the more 
foundational it is. It, it actually yeah. becomes stronger, not weaker. And, Absolutely. And, and I, I, I want to say this, Pastor Darren, I think that the resurrection is undertaught. I think it's underpreached. I don't think we talk about it enough. You know, we preach about it on Easter and funeral services, and then we leave it. Mm -hmm. And this is the fire that fuels the, our faith, yeah. knowing that, hey, we're not living. You know, there are 24 promises in the New Testament um, uh, quantified. More, m the promise we're given with more, more than any other promise in the New Testament, according to frequency, is the promise that our resurrection and Jesus' resurrection are linked. John um, 19, 14, verse 19, that because I live, you will live also, is a promise that's repeated another 23 times in the New Testament. And I think it's not taught enough. I think we're, and I think that the church is impoverished because we don't have a resurrection-centric faith. And what's fascinating, too, about going even deeper in the resurrection, there's so much more there. Yeah, and so much that builds faith as opposed to destroys it. I mean, something that I've, right. I say pretty regularly around here that, you know, if if somebody comes and claims to be God, says that I'm going to be crucified, buried, and resurrected in three days, and then he does it, you probably should listen to what he has to say. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, exactly. And, and it's, again, it's the hinge of, of, for my faith. I mean, when I went through my, fortunately, I went through it before Twitter, so I didn't, you know, start talking about all my questions yeah. um, on, on social media. But, you know, I kept coming back to the resurrection. It's like if this, if, if, if I can get this settled in my mind, then the rest of it I can come along. I can find, like, right. I, I used to call it bookshelf theology. I'll put that on the bookshelf. I'll come back to it. But I got to get to the resurrection. Right, right. That's good. Because otherwise, you know, if, it, if it's not a resurrection, then I don't, the rest of it doesn't matter anyway. It's just a, you know, fun academic exercise like reading Ayn Rand. Like, it's not. Right. But the work that you've done in the thinker society, the work that you've done with your writings, with your podcasts, with your, your traveling and teaching, you, you've paid a, a big price for this. You've done an enormous amount of work. And came out. Oh, but it's been such a blessing, though, to my own faith. Well, I mean, well, I've just followed my faith, you know. I mean, it's it's encouraging. And I want to let people know as well, we have a companion um, Bible study called Body Proof. So there's the original book that you've been so kind to mention. Thank you guys for doing that. Um, but actually, just a few months ago, our Bible study came out. That's the companion. And we actually have footage of all the resurrection sites in Jerusalem, where you literally go with me over my shoulder and we go to all of the the great sites. We go to the tomb of Lazarus. We had to go off roading to. Um, I actually know where the actual road to Emmaus is. I don't mean Emmaus Nicopolis. Right. Um, I mean the actual road to Emmaus, where there's cylindrical Roman milestones that are two thousand years old. We we filmed inside the Garden Tomb and inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We filmed um, in just amazing places. Dominus Flevit, the church where Jesus wept, um, on the on the western side of the Mount of Olives. So. Just really, really exciting stuff. So this is available for churches and for Bible study groups. So I just wanted to mention that as a companion. Yeah, all we'll make sure demand. we'll make sure our people get a link for that too in our. Um, Thanks. Especially if you've, you know, if you're listening, I, I, I was going to say if you're if you're questioning, don't not even if you're questioning, just just put another brick in the wall of your faith. You know, this Amen. type of material, uh, it stands up to scrutiny. It stands up, and what right. what's what I love about it is that it doesn't. It's not just one. Discipline. You're talking archaeology, right? Physiology, theology. You know, history. Yeah. Like these multiple disciplines uh, across science, uh, all confirm. You know, we're not having to just take one and then okay, well, this one doesn't really confirm it over here, so but we're just going to have to trust this one. But right. it's one of the reasons why I really believe our support of Israel matters so yes. very much because if. Mm -hmm. If Israel falls into the hands of radical Islam, these artifacts, these things that oh. have proven our history will be lost forever. And yes, they will. I get, I'm just mystified by hearing Christians um, not, not even not supporting Israel, but actively campaigning against Israel. It's, it's an incongruent idea. Even if you just, if you take out all the theology, whatever, the idea that these things would be lost to history, even the story of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they made it out, you know, just in time for the 1940s. Right, literally. Yeah, like just in time. Because what we know that one of the things that Islam, radical Islam especially, wants is no connection to the land at all to Christians or mm -hmm. Jews. Uh, from the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. And to wipe that out means uh, every time something is uncovered, right, at City of David, right, with our friend Zev mm -hmm. Orenstein or whatever, it's one more proof that 
Israel belonged there and one more proof that Islam doesn't. But that's my point is, is we support Israel because God loves and blesses his people. But if you just common sense say yeah, you, everything you just did in that tour, you wouldn't have been able to do in an Islamic country. No. And I mean, I, I wrote a book on ISIS and covered, I mean, they were, they made a hundred million dollars ravaging museums, selling it on the black market to fund their terrorist campaigns. So yeah, if you take the faith element completely out of it and just look at it as a human, yeah, <laughs> the, this group um, literally ravaged, um, you know, museums across Iraq and other places. And they would, uh, and make no mistake, they do the same to Israel. And 100%. any vestige of Christian, and they did it, by the way, historically. I mean, don't forget Martin Luther. I mean, he thought, he, he exegeted back to Luther, Ezekiel 38, 39, his Gog and Magog was Suleiman the Great and the Ottoman Caliphate that was 400 miles from his doorstep. Hmm. And he literally in his commentary writes that, we could be saved from Muhammad's theology even if we're not saved from his sword. And he called, he called on pastors to rally up, and he, he literally read the Quran, and then he did a, a polemic against the Quran, al Quranis. You can see this in the Wittenberg Museum at his house. Um, and you can see he literally did a, a apologetic polemic against Islam, and he writes it in Latin so that other pastors can read it because all the pastors then would have been fluent in Latin about here's how we can save ourselves from Muhammad's theology. So mm. it's pretty fascinating to just, it's interesting. Every time history repeats itself, we pay a higher price. Mm. That's a good word right there, a warning. I want to circle all the way back as we wrap this up. At the very beginning, you mentioned um, that the word apologetics makes you squirm. Mm -hmm. Can you dive into that a little bit? Like what's... Yeah. Where does that come yeah, from? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't like using terms in the Christian world that have to be completely uh, overemphasized and defined. Um, apologetics, people think I'm apologizing about something, and it has a very <laughs> militant— and then people that do know what it is, they associate it with a very militant form of apologetics that um, I think is a hindrance to reaching people. It's a polemical form of apologetics that makes fun of atheists, that makes fun of nonbelievers, that makes fun of skeptics and how dumb they are to not be Christians. And that is just not what I see reflected. You know, when when Paul, when Paul Peter writes that, be ready to give an answer, he says, do so with meekness and fear. Yeah. You know, the more I know about my faith, the more comfortable and relaxed I am in a faith dialogue. The more I know about my faith, the more, the better, a better listener I am. I don't do most of the talking. I listen, and I'm able to um, surgically insert questions that invite a conversation rather than assumptions or assertions. Um, and so that's why I, I don't ever use it. I, I don't, I, I, I literally get an allergic reaction with the word apologetics. I don't even like to be known as an apologist. I'm a Christian thinker. Um, and I want to be, that's what I want to be. I'm trying to fulfill the great commandment in my own life. And if other people are blessed as I do that in my yeah. own life, by me just trickling out the crumbs like I do to my kids, um, before they go in screensaver mode when I'm talking, um, you know, then it's a blessing. <laughs> so that's why I meant, I just, I, I believe yeah. in being a Christian thinker. So. Yeah. I think that, uh, semantics, uh, the, the language matters, right? And in right. certain words, gain a meaning that whether they were originally meant to mean that or not, it's kind of what they become, you know, with the zeitgeist. Right. And, you know, when it comes to the apologetic, especially like the passage you just quoted from First Peter, when, you know, he says with humility, uh, but he says, be ready to give an answer for the, for the hope that you have. Yes, and hope. The, uh, if you're angry, you don't sound very hopeful, right? And if you're not no. sounding, if you don't sound hopeful, no one's going to ask you why you have hope. Right. And. Uh, one of the things that we are seeing in our church, and, and I know other pastors from talking to them, is that, you know, the, there are a lot of people seeking right now, and what they're seeking is hope. Like, who's going to stand right. for my family? Who's going to tell my yes. son that he can't be a girl? Who's, who, mm -hmm. And they're looking, and we, I've had very specific conversations with people who are in our church family who said uh, they, they're just looking for hope. And, right. Uh, and so— the, the well-crafted arguments, the theology is very important in it, um, and but they're not asking me. No one has ever asked me, "Hey, give me, uh, give me a reason for that really well-crafted argument that you just, you know." Yeah, exactly. Give me a reason for the hope, and the and the answer, yeah. of course, is the well-crafted argument for the hope. You guys ever watch Dr. Chatterjee? He's got a podcast in London. He's a doctor, a medical doctor. Have you heard of no. his name? He's, he's got a huge following. I just listened to a, I had a back incident uh, happen to me about two weeks ago where I injured my back and, and he did a whole podcast on pain and how we manage pain with hope 
rather than with medication. And I'm not saying I'm against all forms of medication, but I went home with Oxy. I went home with uh, muscle relaxers. Miss Church was literally out of my mind by Monday. And uh, it was a terrible experience, and I had no hope. And I thought, I'm in the busiest season of my life right now. I'm getting ready to host a, a conference on Worldview that, I mean, people are coming from all. I'm not yeah. going to walk. And I started listening to his podcast. And, I mean, it's not a Christian podcast, but it gave me hope because the first word out of the person he was interviewing was pain can be managed and movement is healing. And we don't believe in healthcare induced uh, uh, disability. And that's what I was giving. I was having healthcare induced disability. I went to an ER. I was told I had bulging disc. I was sent home with a bunch of medicine that literally I went out of my mind for a couple of days. And so this thing of hope is a powerful thing. And people, yeah. I mean, I would go anywhere to listen to it. So I found a podcast that gave me hope that has helped me turn the corner. And that's what was interesting about this resurrection Bible study. Audrey, my wife, she did a word search in my Bible study, and I used the word hope over a hundred times in oh. this Bible study. And I, I didn't even mean to. That was a thing. Like the, the resurrection is is the key that unlocks the hope, hope and yeah. we should defend that our hope just as much as we defend our faith. Yeah. So Well, Jeremiah, tell them um, tell our audience what is the best way to stay up to date with you? Like your website, social media, what, what's the best way for Man, someone who wants to follow along? Thank you for asking. Uh, definitely Instagram. We just had a reel that went over a million views. That's never happened to our ministry before, which is such a blessing. Um, we, I have an email list at christianthinkers.com. So I, I do write the email myself. No one, I don't have any writers or staff speech writers. So sometimes I'll send three emails in a month and sometimes I'll send three in a year. So it's just a matter of when I have time. But I do like to keep everyone up to date. And I probably social media is the best, but that email list is gold yeah. too because I send out some great stuff. I've definitely, I enjoy keeping up with you on social media. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know, it gives me the false impression that we're staying in touch. Yeah, but, we are. We but, are. You and I are bros, man. Yeah. <laughs> but I have, uh, but I've, the content has been helpful for me. So thanks for that. And thanks for being oh, with us you know, here today. Absolutely. Thank you, oh, Jeremiah. Been great, you guys. Thanks for joining us. ChristianThinkers.com. Make sure that you go and check that out. And uh, thank you for joining us on the Deeper Podcast. And if you want to know more about what's happening uh, here at Conduit Church, ConduitChurch.com. And of course, check out ChristianThinkers.com as well. Have a great week.